Does anybody seek after God? This is a question that arises from something that Paul says in Romans 3. And he's quoting from David's Psalm 14. And he says that there is none that understands and none that seeks after God. So the chosen Charlies tend to interpret this verse quite literally, that there is literally nobody that seeks after God. Um, I've not heard a lot of Free Will Freddies give extensive discourses on this idea. I think the only person that I can think of that I remember doing a video on this subject that I've seen anyway was uh, Mike Sampat, who you will know as Toronto Bible Study. And he would say that Romans 3 is not being literal. Um, it doesn't mean that absolutely nobody seeks after God. And Mike, if you ever do watch this video, I, I hope I haven't misunderstood you or misrepresented you there. If I have, I apologise. But um, he would point you to Psalm 14 and get the context uh, because it opens stating that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And so uh, he, Mike Sampat, or Toronto Bible Study, would say that if you bear that context in mind, that would be like our atheists today and our Christ haters, that they are the ones who don't seek after God. And that is true, obviously, they don't. So uh, I don't know I don't know if his view is consistent with most of the other free will Freddies, um, but he's going to have to be my token example of the free will position. So my disagreement with uh, that interpretation is that it's, it's the way, I mean, yes, the, there is the context in Psalm 14, but it's really the way that Paul is quoting this passage, using it to explain that we are all under sin. And that, that really is irrespective of our beliefs about God, you know, Jew or Gentile. So to not take the statement literally is to say that none seeks after God is hyperbolic. But then the very next verse says that Paul carries on this same thought, same pronoun. And although he's, par um, he's paraphrasing the psalm slightly, uh, he carries on quoting the same psalm, saying, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable or filthy. There is none that does good. Well, of course, we agree that there is none that does good. And we take that statement literally, or at least we do if we take that verse in the context of the entire passage, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we, we don't randomly make that aspect only about atheists in their present day sin. So... I do think that you have to do some strange gymnastics, really, with Romans 3 to say that all have sinned and fallen short, not not justified by works, that's everybody, but nobody seeking after God, that's just a specific type of person or it's hyperbolic. When Paul doesn't really use it in that way, so I would apply there is none that seeks after God in the same way as I would, I would apply all have sinned and come short, okay? because it's just keeping the language consistent there. Now, some of you will have a problem with this, because I'm sure if we sat around a table and discussed your personal testimony, some of you probably have a story where, to some extent, it sounds like you were seeking the truth and, and looking for God. And, I, and I'm sure in, in some aspects that you did. Okay. Um, now, I, I don't really like to talk about my testimony on my channel because it, it's quite a mundane story, to be honest. It'd be really boring, but it's it's not usually relevant to anything that I say, and I don't remember many details. But my story perhaps isn't too dissimilar to the prodigal son story where I was living in the world, didn't give me any satisfaction, so I went back to be with my heavenly father, so to speak. But it was actually listening to false prophets, um, Todd White and Dan Moeller, who made me want to be a Christian. There was something alluring about their happy, victorious way that they presented themselves. However, because they are technically false prophets, their gospel message never really made it very clear to me. I also bumped into lordshippers like David Wilkerson and Leonard Ravenhill. And to, to cut a long story short, I, I was confused about repentance. I, I knew that I was a sinner and I knew that Jesus died for my sins. But I couldn't honestly say that I'd repented of all of my sins because I was struggling with sin. And I was very upset and I didn't know what to do. So I looked on YouTube and for uh, I just looked for repentance and salvation. The first sermon I found, as I've said before, Stephen Anderson. And this was for a short while before he became famous and in the news. And he showed me how God repented of this and that and so on. So if you wonder why I focus on repentance, that's why. Getting back on topic then, 
a casual observer might look at my story and say, well, you sought out Todd White on the internet, you looked around for a bunch of different preachers, you went on YouTube and found this stuff and eventually realised the truth. That sounds like you were seeking after God, right? Well, here's the problem with that, is that I did not seek God in a vacuum. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up attending a Pentecostally charismatic type church, really. Uh, it, it, it wasn't weird or overly cultish, but there were some weird and cultish things that had gone on over the years. And back in the 90s, we still had uh, Anglican style schooling back then. So we would sing Christian hymns in school back then and say the Lord's Prayer. Um, that doesn't happen in a lot of schools now. It maybe does happen in some. Um, it's far less common because of atheism and secularism and sodomy and multi multiculturalism. It's very politically incorrect these days to do that. But I, I grew up with some kind of Christian awareness and exposure to the biblical God. When I was first looking into religion in my young 20s, I also listened to some Muslim preachers because I struggled at first with the mutually exclusive claims to give credence to either one. Uh, of course, I now realise how ridiculous that is because one book was written by over 40 witnesses recording other witnesses and another book was written by one written witness. So have a guess who's correct. It doesn't take genius. But then, of course, there are many other religions. But Christianity had already caught me on its track to be by then. So the point that I'm trying to get at here is that me becoming a Christian who believes in salvation by grace and that Jesus will not let any be plucked out of his hand it might sound like I sought after God, but in a sense it was, in a way, from my point of view anyway, like a series of happy accidents. I sort of fell into it, really, because my story could have gone any other way. What if I did really well in the world's eyes and wasn't driven by depression and anxiety to even consider religion? You know, what if I had all the riches of the world or I became a celebrity at a young age? What if I heard some firecracker sermon by the Muslims that Islam is true? What if I had been so drawn in by the emotionalism of Todd White and Dan Mola that I, I, I idolised their definition of God rather than my own? What if I had become a lord shipper? What if all of my family had been killed in a plane crash and I became permanently disabled? Would I have fallen away and had some bitter resentment against God? You know, what if that happened now? Um, so you, you've, you've got to realise that when unsaved people do seek after God, quote unquote, it's not like they just wake up one day and say, right, that's it. I'm going to get my house in order. I'm going to read about all of these, you know, different religions. I'm going to dedicate my life to the truth and I'm going to go around the world if I need to. And I'm going to pray all day, every day for that true God out there somewhere to reveal himself to me. Now, I'm sure people want to imagine that it works like that, but it, Frankly, it doesn't. Um, you know, I once knew a lady in church who had a non-Christian family and her sister had gone on a spiritual journey to somewhere in Asia, maybe India or somewhere, and came back to the UK very disappointed. Uh, she didn't get the experience she was hoping for out of that trip, but she wasn't curious to try out Christianity because the problem with a lot of those types of people, it, they're not looking for the truth they're looking for their truth or, or my truth as it's often called by these sort of predominantly women these spiritual witch type new age types my truth is one of their buzzwords that's what a lot what of the new ages are looking for they're looking for my truth not the truth right now if you remember brother james who i featured on my channel uh, we know from our experience out soul winning that there's a lot of spiritual people out there who they're not atheist or agnostic, but they're not interested in the gospel of the free gift of salvation. We've bumped into Christians who have even admitted that they don't know how to get to heaven, but they just they don't want to spend five, ten minutes letting us explain it to them so that they know it so clearly. Um, we've bumped into theological professors who regularly attend religious conferences, but don't want to talk to us for some reason. We've bumped into religious people who give us time to talk, but then reject the gospel when it's given to them. We've had Christians who have slammed the door in our face after we told them that repentance of sins is antithetical to the free gift of grace. We've had Christians lecture, lecture us about James too, ironically, even though we're out giving the gospel and they're sat at home watching telly. You know, figure that one out. 
and, and think about this. Um, why were we at soul winning in the first place? Why did Jesus send his disciples out to preach? Because we have to bring the gospel out to them. Because they're not doing a very good job of finding it and seeking it themselves, right? There, there will, of course, be people who get saved by finding a video on YouTube where somebody preaches the right gospel. But then compare that with the millions of people who watch Joel Osteen or John MacArthur. A lot of people who seek out these Christian videos are not necessarily doing it because they're so desperately looking for the truth in comparing person A with person B. Rather, I would argue that a lot of them are really like lost sheep without a shepherd who don't know a Nazarite from a Nazarene. And they're looking for answers to the wrong questions and looking for what their itching ears want to hear. Now, there are a lot of videos on YouTube where people give their testimonies about how they got on their knees and they found a cabin in the woods for five days and separated themselves and read their Bible for hours a day and they reached a place of full surrender. So what is the product of these testimonies where I sought after God and I surrendered and I did this? It's work salvation, it's conditional security because that's what those testimonies and those near-death experiences are always trying to tell you. Sinless perfectionist hypocrites, that's what that produces. Prideful people who think that they're better than everybody else because they found God. So, look, listen to Jesse Morrell's testimony and he'll tell you all about what a sinner he was, but then he became a loner and just started to seek the Lord and read his Bible, but he believes in a false gospel. Okay, Michaela Cooper will tell you about how she went to a cabin in the woods and she's going to seek after God with all of her heart and soul and strength yet she believes in a false gospel. And Mike Rakowski, he'll tell you about how he overcame his sins and sickness in life and he obeyed the commandment to love the Lord with all his heart and he used to be rich, but then he gave up all his money. Um, yet he's one of the most prideful, self-absorbed people on this planet. He constantly talks about himself, constantly exalts himself, on a plan and on a planet of 8 billion people, he thinks he's the only one who's qualified to preach the truth. Okay. So if you seek the Lord with all your heart and you repent of all your sins, you will find the truth. But for some strange reason, it only worked for Mike Rakowski. It didn't work for Jesse Morell or Michaela Cooper. You know, they must have done something wrong. They missed a trick. Now, of course, this is where people will invoke um, Jesus' statement. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be answered. And this comes from the um, Sermon on the Mount. But, but that sermon was preached to a multitude who had already heard the gospel in chapter 5 with a focus on the disciples. And Jesus, throughout that sermon, says, Your Father, whereas often when preaching about eternal life to unsaved audiences, like in John's gospel, he would often say, The Father or My Father. So when these legalists love to exalt themselves with their testimonies, they're basing it on a verse that is more geared towards a saved audience that doesn't apply to them and then rejecting a verse that concluded them under sin because the same passage that concluded them under sin says that none seeks after God yet they think they're saved because they sought after God and you know you greasy graces you just won't seek after it and, and therein lies the problem so you see that if salvation is by grace and not of yourselves you were saved because of God's unmerited favour. It's not deserved. There's a lot of people who claim to be seeking the truth, but they never get there. These sinless perfectionists isolate themselves in the woods, but they earned the right to heaven. There's a lot of truth seekers who look at all these different conspiracies and they're exposing this and exposing that, but they don't believe the gospel. There's a lot of spiritualists seeking the truth but but not the truth as, as i said there's christian scientists and apologists and atheists going to the ends of the earth to scientifically establish whether there really is a god or not but of course many of these apologists aren't saved many of these apologists they you know they have a works-based salvation because nobody can boast and say well i proved god is real with all of my extensive research and that's how i got saved so again, to reiterate what I said earlier, you know, even if your testimony would suggest that in a sense you did look for the truth and you did find God that way, 
you, you didn't come to God entirely in a vacuum. You know, if you did look online and listen to different preachers and gospel presentations, you have had some kind of external exposure to the idea of there even being God or even a biblical God. And some of you found channels like mine because you were very damaged by Lordship Salvation and it made you very confused and distressed. But then God had mercy on you because you need to realise that there that many Lordshippers they won't have that experience that you've had. They either will never see that documentary that I did, or they'll see it and they'll still reject it, right? And some of them they've been they've been given over to lordship. No amount of listening to anti-lordship material would ever change their mind, and, and they would denounce me as a heretic before even hearing most of my arguments. You know, before they've even listened to what I've said. And so, God to some extent has to lift the blinders off of your eyes and stage a series of events that led to, to you going to the truth so it's not that you sought the truth but that rather god led you to the truth calling you by his grace and that's why we preach the gospel that's why we have missionaries and that's why we preach to the lost because they're not doing a very good job finding it on their own we have to give it to them okay and, you know, what's the product of these people seeking the truth for themselves? Well, it's work salvation, it's conditional security, it's non-Christian truth seeker movement, it's religious experiences that feel good in the flesh, it's people finding their truth and not the truth. There's, there's more that I could say on that. Um, I wanted to talk about visions of Paul's road to Damascus, um, but for the sake of time, maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. But, you know, even Paul's vision to Damascus... Paul's vision was not about him getting on his knees and turning from his sins. It was about Christ saving him when he was persecuting the church. It was entirely by grace. That's very different from a lot of the visions and the dreams and the near-death experiences that we hear most of these Christians giving us, and they think that they're equivalent to, to what happened to Paul, and they're not. 